Okay, so welcome back to another video. So today, this time, usually when I have the com number comparison, we're actually comparing numbers, but this time we're actually comparing functions. So of course, being functions, we have to add the notations that specifically for a function like this, for x everywhere in the reals, which of the following is bigger? So the two functions we are going to compare, both being trigonometric functions, are, is cosine of sine of x and sine of cosine of x. So, of course, just like any other comparison video or usually that I would do or what you want to do, you can actually just plug in such functions into, you know, a calculator or in any sort of um, computational device. And obviously you can see like which between the two is bigger. But of course, this being a video and we want to actually prove this out for which of the two is the biggest. Well, of course, we're going to have to um, exclude that sort of advantage. So. By doing this sort of function comparisons for specifically what we have is trig functions, of course, cosine and psi, we will, of course, be utilizing its properties of those trig functions, utilizing such things as the sum and differences of its angles and the phase shift. And then we, what we can do is we're actually going to use the fact that uh, the sine function specifically is actually bounded to actually use to our advantage to assign such a compound inequality or inequality to that aspect. Then we can actually do a little bit of comparison and actually actually deduce and find which between these two functions is the biggest. So with that all the way, let's actually just uh, jump right in. So first thing we know is that for the phase shift specifically for sine of x, we know that that can be written as negative cosine at um, phase shift specifically at the pi over 2 radian, pi over 2 and then plus x. This, of course, being that we have that, this is actually, you know, for cosine and sine, it's actually continuous everywhere in the reals. We can actually now say that now let's actually plug in our input for x, replace that with cosine of x. So now I have sine of cosine of x is going to equal to negative cosine of pi divided by 2, and then add this with cosine of x. So with this, what we're going to do now is we're actually going to take the difference of these two functions over here. So taking the difference, so I have cosine of sine of x, then subtract sine of cosine of x. So this being the case, we're actually going to sub, um, substitute this back over here. So now we have a difference of cosine functions over here. So we have now cosine of um, sine of x and then subtract, but now that becomes a plus since this is the negative over here. So plus cosine of pi divided by 2 and then add this with cosine of x. So now we we'll actually be using the nice little formula for the sums of the angles of the cosine functions, which says that, well, for our input specifically. So what we have is, well, it's the sum of cosine, um, cos the sum of cosines, not the angle inside, but so what we have is that, let me write the note that, so for a value cosine of capital A plus cosine of capital B, this is actually simply just going to equal to two times cosine of a plus b divided by 2, then multiply by cosine of a subtract b, and then divide it by 2. Okay, so we'll be using this formula, and then we're actually going to use uh, plug in our inputs over here. So that's um, pretty much just a guessing. We can actually, of course, obviously figure out what value goes in what. So now putting this back together, so now we have um, putting this over here, continuing on. So this is going to be 2 multiplied by cosine of, now I have sine of x plus pi divided by 2. Add this with cosine of x, then all this being divided by 2. And then now multiply with cosine of now sine of x, okay? And then subtract pi divided by 2, then subtract cosine of x, and then all this being divided by 2. Okay. So now there's some things that we actually want to, you know, readjust in order to make things a little bit easier. But first things first, so continuing forward, um, I have now two then cosine. So now I have a pi over two divided by two. So let's actually put that as pi divided by four. Then next what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna write this differently such that we actually have a radical under our denominator. So I have a one divided by the square root of two. And then now we multiply this by sine of x plus cosine of x all this being divided by the square root of two. And in a similar fashion, we're gonna do the same thing for over here too. So it's gonna be cosine, and then now it's gonna be negative pi divided by four, and then add this with one divided by the square root of two, multiply by sine of x, and then subtract cosine of x, all being divided by the square root of two. 
Okay, so you might be thinking, why do we actually, you know, rewrite in such a thing? So here's the thing that we can actually make things a little bit simpler and that it simplifies things out. We're gonna notice that sine of x plus cosine of x divided by square root of two, and the same thing over here for the subtraction. If you actually go backwards and use the sum of the angles identity for your um, cosine function of the inputs, or rather the sine specifically, because this is actually going to reduce to just sine of x at this with pi divided by four. And you can actually, you know, plug in the numbers to that formula to get that this is gonna to equal to the same thing. And then similarly in the same thing over here, this is instead gonna be the subtraction of sine of x subtract pi divided by four. Okay, so now with all that, so now, now we have so far, it's gonna be two times cosine of pi divided by four, and then add this with one divided by the square root of two, multiply by sine of x plus pi divided by four, and then multiply again by cosine of negative pi divided by four, and then add this with one divided by the square root of two, then multiply by sine of x subtract pi divided by four. Okay, so we have come to the conclusion that so far that the difference over here that I just underlined is, has been simply reduced to this following over here. So is there another way that how we can reduce this even further? Well, we don't actually have to necessarily do that step because now this is where we're gonna be utilizing the inequality. So those greater than or equal than um, signs. So we'll actually be utilizing the fact that we know that the function sine of x is a bounded function, specifically the absolute value of a sine of x is gonna be uh, less than or equal to one. And another thing is that I'm actually gonna write that one divided by the square root of two is also written as the same thing as two times the square root of two divided by four. This is actually just the sake of um, analyzing the number comparison that we will be using eventually. So utilizing these two facts, we're gonna first pay attention to our uh, pi divided by four plus one divided by square root of two, and then sine of x plus pi divided by four. Then we'll do the same thing for this input over here. So first things first, we're gonna look at this number over here. So uh, one divided by the square root of two, and then sine of x plus pi, then divided by four. So we notice that because we utilize the fact that this is actually a bounded function, so we know that this is actually gonna be less than or equal to just one divided by the square root of two. And then this is the same thing written as mentioned, two times the square root of two divided by four. In other words, that can be also be written as the same thing such that it's less than or equal to three divided by four which of course, can we also say that it's less than or equal to pi and then divided by four. Well, to put this even further in perspective, I don't have to necessarily um, put in the equal sign as of course those numbers are different, but this actually just holds, um, holds the following over here. So with that, now let's actually um, analyze the same thing actually for the negative. So one divided by the square root of two and then sine of x plus pi and then divided by four, which we know that that's actually gonna be greater than or equal to one divided by the square root of two, well, negative. So actually, let me actually change this up just a bit, just so I don't actually throw in some confusion for myself and for you guys as well. So we'll actually put this as less than or, or less than and then less than, okay, and then so, to put this into another perspective, so put the same thing yet again. So this is gonna be equal to negative two times the square root of two divided by four, which of course, this is actually gonna be uh, greater than negative three divided by four, which also can we say it's um, bigger than negative pi divided by four. Putting this all back together, if we actually put this back as a compound inequality, then let me actually put this in a, uh, another marker or different color. So now putting this back together, the compound inequality we have is that negative pi divided by four is gonna be less than or equal to, uh, so one divided by the square root of two, and then times sine of x plus pi divided by four, which is less than or equal to positive pi divided by four. And so you can also now, because we showed that now, all we have to do is let's just add the pi over four back into this entire thing over here to now say that this is now gonna be zero, which is less than or equal to pi divided by four, add this with one divided by the square root of two, then sine of x plus pi divided by four is now gonna be less than or less than or equal to pi divided by two. Okay, and so now if we just take this cosine of this entire thing over here, so now that we have to imply that cosine of pi divided by four plus one divided by the square root of two, 
and sine of x plus pi divided by 4 is indeed going to be greater than or equal to 0. Okay, now we can actually do the same thing in the long run all over again for this following value, but it actually follows a similar argument just exactly as this follows right here. So now, instead to reduce all that down, I'm just going to write this down as similarly, similarly, negative pi divided by 4 is less than or equal to negative pi divided by 4, or actually let me first write this as uh, 1 divided by 1 divided by the square root of 2 times sine of x subtract pi divided by 4 and then less than or equal to pi divided by 4. And so now I'll just add a negative pi divided by 4 to this entire compound expression. So now that'll just leave us with the following. We will now have just negative pi divided by 2 is going to be uh, less than or equal to negative pi divided by 4. Add this with 1 divided by square root of 2, then sine of x subtract pi divided by 4, which is going to be less than 0, implying that if I take the compound inequality, or not compound inequality, if I take the cosine of this entire thing, so cosine of negative pi divided by 4, add this with 1 divided by square root of 2, sine of x minus pi divided by 4 is indeed going to be greater than or equal to 0. Okay, and so with this, so now just going back to that entire expression that we actually put all the expressions here, so here and here, then substitute this back over here. Now we can actually now come to the conclusion that specifically the difference, so let's actually go to the blue marker for this one. So now basically the difference says that cosine of sine of x, then minus sine of cosine of x is indeed going to be greater than or equal to zero and then we'll just add this back to both sides to now conclude that the following that indeed cosine of sine of x is indeed going to be uh, bigger than sine of cosine of x okay and so with this this actually concludes our final answer we know that indeed that this is actually going to be bigger than zero over here so that there we have it cosine of sine of x is indeed going to be bigger than sine of cosine of x just like that and of course we can actually just graph the functions those two functions to see that indeed that cosine of sine of x is indeed bigger well now looking at it back now that we graph this the, there's no point that they actually intersect each other so really i should have had to change that to say that that's actually strictly greater than zero in other words or strictly greater than sine but there we have it we actually did all this proof and then we actually come to this conclusion so yeah that's uh Pretty cool if you ask me.